joined in New York by one of the world's smartest investors, uh, head of the Rockefeller International, uh, founder of Breakout Capital, and now doing his own thing. Ruchu Sharma, fantastic to have you with us, and thank you for giving us time. Great to be here. We're here at the Columba Circle in uh, New York. We're going to go into Central Park for a walk with Ruchu and try and understand what Ruchir is thinking of the India story and his thoughts are always at the intersection of macroeconomics and Indian politics, a very interesting and unique perspective. Ruchir, I want to start by asking about uh, your views on the India growth story at the moment. Till a few years ago, governments were talking about double digit, 10 percent plus uh, growth rates. Now, six and a half percent is all policymakers are speaking about. Is six and a half, seven the new normal? Is this what India should expect realistically over the next few years? Well, I think if you look at India's growth trajectory over the last 40, 50 years, you find a very tight fit with what's happening globally and what happens in India. Mm -hmm. So when we had this extraordinary boom in the 2000s, where the Indian economy did grow at 9% uh, or so, we have to take one thing very important into account the global economy was booming back then. The global economy was growing at, at about 4% or so. Emerging markets in general were growing at 7%. In the current era, and this is a point I've been making, which is that the global economy's growth rate has now slipped to about 2 to 2.5%. And in the entire history of India's economic development, the Indian economy on a sustained basis has never been able to grow more than about 3 percentage points faster than the global economy. So what's the logical conclusion here? That the global economy is going to be growing at 2, 2.5%. Two mm -hmm. Then for the Indian economy to grow much faster than 5.5%, 6% is extremely difficult. It's never been done before, even during the heydays of India's growth story back in the 2000s. Why is the global economy growing at this pace of 2, 2.5%? Two because the demographics have changed. Uh, the world's population is not growing at the rate that it was. Even India's population growth rate has slowed down significantly, as you know. Then when you look at uh, uh, factors such as deglobalization, that's also coming to play now. That's changing how India's growth trajectory will also be. So these global factors are pulling down India's growth rate as well. India's export growth rate in the uh, peak boom years used to be 25-30% a year. It is impossible now for India's exports to grow 25-30% when the global economy is not growing so rapidly. So I think there's a major shift across the world uh, in the growth rates and that's what I think is leading to a slowdown in India's trend growth rate as well. So yes, to cut a long uh, story short here, I think a five and a half, six kind of growth expectation for India is much more realistic under this global economic scenario then, you know, just throwing about numbers like 9 or 10 percent, that's the kind of growth rate where you get when the global economy is booming. And also, if you are able to take the kind of massive structural reforms that China was able to take, but India's political economy, I don't think, allows for that. You know, the, your former organization, Morgan Stanley, put out a report recently on the last nine years being a transformational decade, and this is being called India's moment. The fact that the global economy is growing at a slower pace uh, than when China's economy was going through a similar phase of development, how much of a disadvantage is that for India in its growth cycle at this moment and where we could end up being in a 10-20 year horizon uh, given how China grew at a time when the world was growing really fast? No, I think it's a major factor. So therefore, when people talk about these growth rates of 9-10% and stuff, and this is a problem I find with a lot of people back in India that the view tends to be very insular. Mm -hmm. We're not taking into account what's happening in the rest of the world when we're coming up with these projections. It's a very insular view that, you know, uh, it's almost as if it's our God-given right that we can grow at those pace. So I don't take these reports very seriously because I think that it's like in terms of the factors that they just don't take into account the global context and they tend to be very insular. Um, much is made of the fact that by 202728, India could emerge as the third largest economy in the world, overtaking Japan and Germany. 
How much of that would you attribute to the economic reforms, the policy measures undertaken by the Modi government in the last 10 years? And how much is just as part of an ongoing process that no matter which government is in power, India was growing earlier and will grow later? Because we have a big election coming. Right. And one of the aspects in that election will be how much of credit can the current government take for putting India on, a, on the growth path that it is right now? Well, I think that um, one thing I, you know, like I do find quite remarkable about this government is that if you look at most governments in the past, um, and this is across the world, typically from an economic management standpoint, the first term tends to be when they carry out the big reforms. The second term is when you end up getting much more complacency and things ease off, right? This is something, a pattern we've seen, even in countries like Russia and Turkey, where Putin and Erdogan first came to power, they were reformers who then ended up becoming uh, much more of autocrats and status over time. The good thing I'll say about the current government is that the, a lot uh, of the good decisions have in fact been taken in the second term uh -huh. rather than the first term. First term, in fact, I was, as you know, very critical of measures such as demonetization and the impact that had on the Indian economy and the kind of shocks that suffered from. The good thing that the current government has done, in, uh, I think, is that more than just about reforms, it's about also not doing the bad things. Uh -huh. And what do I mean by not doing the bad things? Like, one thing which I was completely sort of uh, against was for the government to go out and do some massive stimulus, as was being recommended by many people in 2020. Now, that would have just been completely irresponsible. Uh, and we saw the consequences in the developed countries as well, like the U.S., the kind of inflation that followed when you ended up doing that. And some of the emerging markets, which did do ma massive stimulus in 2020, they did uh, quite poorly after that because they had a lot of macroeconomic imbalances. No, but the government was under a lot of pressure from leading academics, including some Nobel laureates, right. for not spending enough. And it doesn't typically get uh, enough credit for being smart on economic management. Yeah, but on this, I was very clear. I mean, even back in 2020 and very vocal about it and wrote about it as well that we sh that uh, we should have not done big stimulus and I'm happy that we resisted from doing any big stimulus at that point in time so that I, w I would say was the good news as far as the government's concerned but I think that's the history of India which is that generally you find most governments do incremental reform mm -hmm. it's very difficult given the socialist I think DNA of our country for any government to carry out big bang reform unless you have your back to the wall uh, but now, even now, I mean, I just hope that there's so much of momentum currently behind the India story, but it, a lot now needs to come through in the actual numbers. Because if you look at the actual numbers, it's still a bit slow to move. I mean, look at the amount of foreign inv investment coming into the country, for example. Today, you have foreign direct investment in the country, which is just over 1% of GDP. Now, when China was booming, China was attracting FDI of 4% of GDP. Today, on average, other emerging markets attract about 2% of GDP in terms of foreign direct investment. Why do you think India isn't getting more foreign direct investment at this moment, despite all the efforts the government has made? Yes, yeah, so I think that you, these things take some time to come through, but I think that there's more than, you know, so there's foreign direct investment and there's also, I think, a lot about how the domestic businesses are investing. Because if you look at India today, where is the investment boom? It's really happening on the government side. The government's rolling out massive infrastructure and that's happening. But even private sector investment in India today hasn't really picked no, up. So I, I, I want to spend some time on that because one of the big hopes the government had when corporate taxes were slashed deeply was that this would kickstart a virtuous investment cycle. And then the pandemic happened, so that never really took off. We're now seeing some green shoots of private investment kicking in. Uh, do you think that uh, this could lead to a five, seven year investment cycle that everybody's been talking about and hoping for? Or could this be just another flicker which doesn't turn into a big flame? Well, with India, the line I've always said is that this is a country that consistently disappointed the optimists and the pessimists. <laughs> so I think that clearly the pessimists have been proven wrong. My hope now is that the optimists don't get proved too wrong as well, because there's a lot of gaudy optimism about India today, right? I mean, you can feel it everywhere. I think that what we now need are for the numbers to actually come through 
And I think that in that regard, the government needs to do a bit more of introspection about why private investment is not picking up. No, so one you spend factors, time on that. Why do you think that's the case? So I think that one of the factors I, I do feel is that the state machinery needs to be reined in a bit. When I talk to some of the business people and stuff, the amount of power that they, like some of the investigative agencies, the tax authorities have in India today is extraordinary. Now you can argue that the government was trying to do that to specifically target a few people or target a few constituencies, but there are unintended consequences of it. That there is so much of the, the state needs to be reined in. If you look at the successful East Asian economies, mm -hmm. they were very clear about having a very efficient state, which is that state like involvement in the economy, especially in, in this regard, kept being pulled back. Even in places like China, before Xi Jinping came to power, it's very clear that the private sector had a lot of room to run. I think this fear of, you know, like I think that the term in India they use is iced mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, you know, whether it's the uh, income tax, EBI or ED being on your case. I think that that is something which I think we need much more of uh, streamlining and rationalization out there because I think it's that kind of, those kind of factors which I think play on the mind of businesses. Like um, one thing I had pointed out earlier is that we need a lot more of domestic businesses to stay in India. Um, a data that I had analyzed back in 2018 was the number of millionaires leaving India. Uh -huh. uh, that, that number was uh, like surging back then. Luckily in the last couple of uh, years, that number has sort of stabilized. So we need more signs of domestic businesses wanting to stay in India and foreign investors also feeling that from the tax authorities and from the other agencies, you know, they're getting a pretty good fair and, fa and favorable treatment. And, uh, you know, because it's, I think some of these things don't quite translate into bottom up, right? Which is that how should you have a, uh, that how on the ground is this all impacting things? Okay. And I think that is something which uh, we don't quite sort of understand in India. You spoke of how there's a lot of optimism around the India story at this moment. How important is political stability in that matrix of economic optimism? There's a big election next year. The growth that everyone foresees for India over the next 10, 20 years, how much rides on political stability and how much of this India growth story could continue regardless of who's in power? You know, one of the things that I think about India is really uh, underappreciated and I was recently also in Karnataka uh, covering the state election out there, but I think one thing which is really underappreciated about India, something that uh, Prime Minister Modi used to speak about a lot initially, but I think he has toned it down. But I think this is the real strength of India and where I see is its competitive federalism. Mm -hmm. So I think we spend a lot of attention and time in India, in Delhi, what's happening in Delhi, but a lot of the decisions, a lot of the um, ability to attract foreign investment or change the environment on the ground also lies with a lot of state governments. And I think that what India needs to see more of is this competitive federalism, which is that you have states competing with each other uh, to try and attract more investment. But they're already doing that. Exactly. So I think that, like for me, that is what is the counter to your point that is it all about political stability. I'm saying because if you have something at the center, but this, you know, what the states are doing is equally important. So I think that is what really uh, matters for me in terms of you know, what happens in India. You know, one of the things that you spoke about is that the government hasn't done too many bad things. Yeah. Uh, there's a big election around the corner. We saw, you mentioned Karnataka, that in Karnataka the Congress laid out these big five promises which are, you know, derisively called freebies, which did play a role in helping the Congress win Karnataka. Now they repeated that promise in Madhya Pradesh. We're already seeing that state finances are under duress as a result of that, uh, as similar promises are made and, rep and implemented in different states that puts more pressure on state budgets. Is this now a trap that we're in? Could there be a way out? Because the Prime Minister, for what it's worth, uh, says that they don't believe in freebies. But naturally, there's an election and there's pressure, and they have to end up doing uh, things which are populist, which they may not otherwise ordinarily want to do. What's the way out of this, and how dangerous is this, according to you, for the India growth story? You're absolutely correct that this is the big risk, right? Like, instead of 
that the competitive federalism degenerates into competitive populism, mm -hmm. uh, which is that you end up getting all these kind of things happen. But I think it's uh, the problem in India is that the DNA is socialist across the board. I don't think it's a particular party as such, which you know does a lot of these freebies. Because even when the government was going for elections in 2019, the current central government, they did do a lot of. Uh, 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 spending just before the 2019 election. So the hope is that they don't sort of have to do too much of this or they don't, but they, you know, but that is obviously like the risk and I, and I think that it's a risk which is reflective of this socialist DNA. You know, like I still remember uh, this bit of research that I was doing for my previous book which really stayed with me, which is that in India today you have more than a thousand uh, centrally sponsored government schemes uh -huh. or some number. Nobody has a proper count of it. So there's a tendency of just keep coming up with new numbers without knowing what the delivery is. What the good thing I'd say about India, uh, which has happened, is that the delivery mechanism has improved significantly, right? So in the past, if there was only uh, that, that famous Rajiv Gandhi statement mm -hmm. that only 15 pesa of every rupee makes its way to the um, uh, final beneficiary, like what I've been seeing in my travels in India is that that number has dramatically increased now, which is that it's not 15 pesa, uh, and it may not be the entire rupees getting distributed, but maybe 50, 60 percent. There's a very significant improvement. No, in the it's likely mechanism. higher than that because a lot yeah. of it is now direct benefit transfer straight yeah, to somebody's yeah. account. Yeah. So the op and a lot of government purchases also through e-government marketplaces. So the op the avenues for corruption have come down. Yeah, the avenues for corruption through that route where the, the direct beneficiary is getting it have, have reduced significantly. I mean, there's no debate about that. And I think that this is where digitization has played such a big role in helping it up. Whether now, the, as I said, that what you still get to hear when you go out there is how much of are the tax authorities, the investigative authorities, how much power do they have to still extort, uh, to still uh, do that. That is something I still hear a lot of negative prints on. As I said, that what's the idea here? The idea is that the Indian economy is poised to grow uh, at a reasonably fast clip of at least three percentage points faster than the global economic growth. That, that's a pretty significant achievement. That's what India has been achieving for a while. Issue is how do we do even better than that, uh, which is what we'd like to and aspire to do. And in that way, you have to, you know, we have to still um, come up with constructive suggestions on how that is done, rather than sort of feel that, okay, the, like, all we have to do now is to celebrate the story, and there's nothing left, like, you know, which is to be done. I think that mindset is what uh, I think is the biggest risk in India today. One of the government's big hopes is that their production-linked incentives will lead to more manufacturing coming into India, especially at a time when MNCs are looking to diversify their supply chains in a China plus one strategy. There's a big debate about the efficacy of these PLIs. I interviewed Raghuram Rajan in Davos and he was very critical about the low value add from these PLIs. How effective has the government's PLI scheme been in trying to make India a more appealing manufacturing destination? I think it's too early to judge that, but here's what I find really fascinating as far as India is concerned. Um, like I just did an analysis, and like I do this every year, looking at the list of billionaires around the world. Mm -hmm. Now if you look at India, we have 169 billionaires in India. That's a huge increase that's taken place and almost too much of an increase. That if you look at the billionaire population in India today, uh, as a share of the total economy, it's the second highest after Russia among all emerging markets. That's a bit concerning. But here's the one good news that I found when I was doing the analysis. That of those, uh, that the maximum number of billionaires, about 35 of them, now come from the manufacturing sector. That's a huge change because even five years ago, you would barely find a dozen uh, billionaires coming from the manufacturing sector. Now you have 35 of them coming from the manufacturing sector and after that is healthcare. So manufacturing and healthcare together now account for the two largest concentration of uh, billionaires in India and many of them are totally new, people we never heard of. Uh, in the past. But one of the aspects of the same research that you are citing is the concentration of billionaire wealth, which you think is one of the risks that India faces, that there's just wait, like 20 percent of the nation's wealth is with these billionaires and that right. concentration is a risk for a country like India. Why, according to you? 
Well, because I think that if you have, I mean, like, uh, generally, if you have too many billionaires in a country, it sows the seeds for some sort of a populist uh, backlash. Uh, like but we I, saw in France, for example. Yeah, exactly. Or we have, you know, we have seen, like, like, uh, even in places like Russia, the reason why Putin has such a control over the billionaires is because they're really hated by the population uh, out there. And he's got that stick to beat them with. But I think that in, uh, there are two other aspects of the analysis. I, I think that billionaires are celebrated for wealth creation if they are creating their wealth in sectors which are generally seen to be independent, not because of government connections. And also, I think billionaires who are self-made are more celebrated than billionaires who have just inherited their wealth. So in India's case, the two negative scores on that analysis is that the share is very large. Um, every country needs billionaires. We need wealth creation. But just that you don't want any ratio to be out of whack too much. And the second is that you want the billionaires to be created in the so-called productive sectors with not too much government help. And I think that that is where India scores relatively well and the marks have improved. Now, of course, one structural problem in India, and this is uh, like more of a cultural problem, right, which is that, the, that India ranks the highest in terms of the number of inherited billionaires uh, or people who inherited their wealth. But that's a thing which c cuts across the Indian spectrum. It's in politics, it's in movies, that there's such a premium paid to the family and from which family you come from. I think so that's the new change I'm hoping in India that those numbers come down over time. But the good thing is that at least we're seeing new billionaires come through the route in manufacturing, healthcare, many of them first generation billionaires. Ruchir, what's your view on the Indian stock markets? Uh, currently hovering around all time highs. A lot of uh, market analysts are speaking about how 100,000 is only a matter of when not if. And if it is, when do you actually see it happen? Le it's a matter of time, right? Because, like, over time, the Indian stock market in dollar terms has given you a return, uh, you know, of around 10, 12 percent or so every year. And so, in like uh, inflation uh, adjusted terms, too, the Indian stock market has been the best performing emerging market, really, uh, in, over the last 20 years or so. So, I'd say that India has got a very good track record of creating great companies and also of delivering very high returns. When I had done uh, my last analysis nearly a year ago, when India was you know, uh, about to turn 75, mm -hmm. uh, I had then projected that the Sensex would hit 100,000 within a decade. So I think that that is a pretty, I'd say that's a pretty reasonable assumption. I mean, today, just to put this in perspective, in terms of how much there is upside potential in India, the entire stock market of India, if you look at the stock market worth, is the same as uh, the market cap of one company in the U.S., which mm -hmm. is Apple. Sure. So I'd say that there's ample potential for the Indian stock market to do well. The issue is the pace at which it does well. It is today, India is also the most expensive emerging market in the world today. It's the most expensive. So that is, coming back to my original point, that expectations out of India today are very high. Those expectations are reflected in the valuations of the stock market. Now the time has come for the delivery in terms of numbers. We need the numbers to come through. We need FDI in India to get to 2 to 3% of GDP. We need private investment in India to pick up. There's only that much the government can do. The government's gone ahead and done a huge amount of spending on the infrastructure, which is very visible in India as you travel across the country. But I think that now we need the delivery. So we are, so you can you know, say that, that we are cruising at a, at a good altitude, but now to get to the next level is what the world is expecting of us, what, is, what many Indians are expecting of us. That is where now we need to see the um, airlift to happen. One of India's big advantages at this moment is that it has a young population. China's uh, population is in decline, the country is aging, but we're also in the age of artificial intelligence where there are reports which say that 300 million plus jobs would be automated. Does this then put India in a very precarious position where you have a lot of young people entering the working age population, but this is also a time when jobs per se uh, won't be increasing at the speed at which they were in the past. You know, this uh, jobless threat coming from automation, AI, firstly, let's acknowledge, has been grossly exaggerated because these projections have been around for the last five, ten years. I can go back to past eras to when this has happened. What is the ground reality? Take India aside for a second. The global unemployment rate today is extremely low. In the U.S., we have an un unemployment rate of only 3.5% just now. So, uh, 
all these projections of white joblessness coming from automation and uh, all have not happened so far. But AI does pose a bigger threat AI than... AI is there, but I like, I like the old line on this, that uh, the history of development is that uh, it's not jobs which are lost, but professions which are lost. Uh -huh. So we will see a big professional churn, which is that some professions will go out of business. But I always believe that there will always be jobs around. We have seen massive revolutions in the past. We have seen horse carriages being, you know, uh, uh, driven away. We have seen uh, much more of self-driving come. Now we're talking about autonomous vehicles. I think that, so there will always be jobs around, right? The professions will change. What those new professions are is always the harder, like, to no, predict. In the way this is likely to play out, in your view, is this to India's advantage or disadvantage? Because it will require a very skilled workforce uh, with the kind of very cutting-edge STEM skills which India does have but at, at a certain layer in its population and not widely dispersed. Yeah, but you know, like also on this, the thinking keeps on changing because mm -hmm. now the thinking is that with AI, it's in fact the white collar, collar jobs which are a greater threat than the, than the more routine function jobs, whereas the earlier automation threat was much more for the blue collar, uh, blue, blue collar jobs. So, uh, as I know that, I think that this AI is a very new thing. We don't know as yet what the, what the uh, outcome is going to be, but I, I remain relatively optimistic that this, uh, that humans know how to navigate these issues and at the end what you will see is that some professions will be lost but jobs will remain. The bigger challenge is of course for places like India and places like um, uh, even China today. Mm -hmm. You know, we, like you spoke about China's um, demographic decline. But the most shocking statistic about China today is that the youth unemployment rate in China today is over 20%. So I want to come to China. I just want to show our viewers as we walk around uh, Central Park. They're playing baseball. You've picked up, uh, you play any ball? I'm still a cricket lover. Yes, I, I saw lots of cricket balls uh, in your house. Let's spend a moment on China. Yeah. Now, um, a lot of the analysts were talking about how the Chinese economy would bounce back on the back of the pandemic. And recent growth numbers from China seem to suggest that corporate growth is struggling and right. that isn't happening. Is China facing a temporary blip or is it looking at a new normal, very different from what they've seen in the past 30 years? Yeah, I think China's growth rate has been slipping consistently already over the last 15 years. You know, in the 2000s, the Chinese economy grew at a rate of 10%. Last decade, the economy grew at a rate of 6%. I think in the coming decade, my projection is that the Chinese economy will grow at a rate of 25 or 3% uh, every year. So these are so you're far more shift. bearish than a lot of but people I mean, here. Yeah, I mean, I'm... I've been so, but again, for some very fundamental reasons, that China's population growth today is declining. In the history of economic development, there has never been a country that has been able to grow at a rate of even 2% when the population growth is declining. This just hasn't been an instance. So that's one. Two, that China's debt level today, if you look at its total debt level today, is higher as a share of its economy than even the United States. So it has already spent a lot of its bullets. So I think that those demographic and debt kind of dynamics is something which is likely to handicap China's economic growth rate. And so therefore, I don't see the Chinese economy on a trend basis growing at a rate of more than 2.5%, 3%. This year, is, it's expected to grow at 5%, but that's as per official data. And I think that, but that, and also because it's rebounding from a very low base of last year, but a 2.5%, 3% type of growth rate for China is what I think is more realistic. On the complete contrary, there are those who think that China could be looking at a doomsday scenario. Yeah. The debt levels have piled up. You spoke of how the official data can't really be believed right. fully yeah. and that what's built up inside behind the Great Wall is actually much worse than uh, the Chinese government would have us believe. How real could that possibility be? Or is that just like Indians hoping that something goes wrong? With China? <laughs> yeah, I think that one thing which China has in its... Uh, you can say so-called favor, even though that's maybe not the right word, is that a lot of the debt in China, in fact, almost all the debt is owned domestically. Uh -huh. So there are no foreigners who own the debt. Typically, when you end up getting these kind of big crises, it's when the foreigners come calling for the debt. But in China, it's a hothouse effect where everybody owns the debt internally and they can keep playing passing the parcel. Now, that's not good for productivity because over time, if you have too much debt in the system, productivity declines. But a full-scale implosion of China, yeah, there, 
nothing can ever be ruled out, but, uh, but just based on past historical experiences, that's what saves China, I think, from having an outright financial crisis. Now, remember one thing, that if you have an outright financial crisis, sometimes that's the clearing mechanism. That, like even India and other, when you have a crisis, that's when you end up getting the, the maximum reforms, you clean the balance sheets and you move on. I think that's, so that's one thing. But, but they're becoming that, kind of anti capitalism or anti even their private companies who yeah. were their brightest stars and that's never a good thing for any country that hopes to grow that exactly and I think that this is where India needs to sort of once again keep drawing the lesson that when that China did very well when it was very supportive of foreign investment very supportive of private capital when it wanted to learn from you know getting foreign expertise in to the country and and now that China has you know totally vacated that space and there's complete skepticism. You know, I spoke about FDI numbers, that when China was booming, China were, you know, they were attracting FDI numbers, as I said, of 3, 4% of GDP. Now it's, now it, you know, doesn't even do, uh, I think even 1% of its economy uh, in terms of uh, foreign um, investor flows. So I think that that's where, like, India needs to sort of learn that, okay, this is what China did right, this is what it's doing wrong now, how do we, all, like, offer an alternative? And as I said, that having this, the, that the biggest thing I'd like to see in India today is for the state uh, to rein in its, uh, its uh, various uh, 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 arms uh, where the businesses and foreign investors feel much more comfortable than being randomly targeted. Now, you, you can argue that the random targeted is happening because of some political motivation of, uh, of we want to target, but that, I, I think what's very important for the government to realize is that this has major collateral damage as far as private investment is concerned because it sort of leads to uncertainty in the private investment uh, person's mind as well that, this, that they can come after me as well. You know, one of the points that you're making, which is quite different from what general opinion is, uh, is on the issue of the decline of the dollar. Right. You know, a lot of my professors of finance at the Harvard Business School would very emphatically make the point, but where is the alternative that, you know, the dollar declines only when uh, any currency, whether it's the renminbi or any other currency, can step in and play the role of a global currency. Why do you think that the dollar is declining, given the fact that most people are of the view that despite all the inadequacies and limitations, the dollar is the only global currency there is? Well, I've been a big fan of the dollar standard that we've been on and have spoken a lot about in the last decade. But here's what's going on, which is that the really um, jolt that a lot of governments receive around the world was when the U.S. government last year decided to impose financial sanctions on Russia by throwing it off the dollar standard. Uh -huh. I think that was a defining moment because a lot of governments then, including I think an Indian government somewhere, sort of got a bit concerned that if this is what America can do uh, uh, to, to them, now it may be a rational fear, but it's a fear that they can do this to Russia where they can cut them off the entire dollar standard, they can do it to us as well. So I think there is a general feeling around the world that we need to not be as reliant on the U.S. dollar. You're completely correct in saying that, there, that there's no apparent alternatives, but nature abhors a vacuum. Something or the other always comes up. Now, for example, what we have is that the, a lot of central banks in the last few uh, quarters have been buying gold in a very big way uh, because they think that gold could be something that they want to hold rather than the U.S. dollar in the global foreign exchange reserves, particularly because uh, they don't want to hold the Chinese currency. Then there are some of the smaller currencies, like the Australian dollar, the Canadian dollar, even the Swiss franc, that they're quite happy holding those currencies as well. But they can never really challenge the, yeah, so the dollar system in any real way. That's right, but it can chip away at it. Sure. So my point is the fact that this is a long-term trend. Don't expect this to happen tomorrow. These are long-term trends which are in place. The dollar has been the world's reserve currency for 100 years. And now I think that there is a general feeling among everyone, uh, especially the emerging market governments, that we can't be this reliant on the dollar. We have to move off to a different kind of reliance now. So I think that is the key, that n never uh, underestimate the ability of people to find alternatives. This is a very lazy, complacent answer. Oh, there is no alternative, so the U.S. can get away and do whatever it wants to. No, it never works that way. In the last part of this interview, Ruchir, I want to focus on Indian politics. Because not right. just you write on uh, investment and the global macro economy, but also track Indian politics very closely from a very different prism from ordinary political journalists. 
Is uh, Prime Minister Modi's re-election in 2024 a foregone uh, certainty or do you think that the verdict in Karnataka makes things a lot more exciting? Well, I think we have learned over time, Rahul. I've learned it also from, you know, the last time that we, we covered the election that the state and national elections in India are two very different uh, uh, two very different exercises, right? Which is that the state uh, that, that we know when there were a series of victories that the opposition parties enjoyed in 2018, it gave a sort of false impression that the fact that the opposition was, you know, uh, getting its momentum to topple the uh, government back then. I think that the state and central election is very different. So I don't want to overread the Karnataka result for what it means in 2024. I think that the, the, the base case scenario for most people now is the fact that I think most people, if you ask them, will expect in 2024 for Modi to come back. The issue is that how many seats can be chipped away from the majority that they had back then. That's the base case scenario. But we still have many months to go. But yeah, I think that the consensus expectations that I have no way of, of sort of knowing if, if that's going to be right or wrong at this stage, yeah, yeah, if at all. Now, um, because Karnataka was also so fascinating, like you pointed out, because in 2018, the BJP got 35, 36 percent of the vote share. In the national election, it went up to 53. Now it's back to 35, 36. So it just tells you the fact that I think in India's case, what I've seen over time is that the how voters vote, uh, especially with Modi, in the state election and the national election uh, is very different. I think the more like, interesting thing is that the BJP on its own is not being able to expand much of its footprint ac across India in terms of the fact that it's, it's like despite all its advantages that it has, the money, the, the uh, organizational resources, the BJP's uh, share of the total um, uh, footprint in India has you know, sort of reverted back to where it was 10 years ago after a high of 2017. But at a national level, when Modi is on the ticket, there's a, probably a 10 to 15 percent vote premium. For if you, if you look at history and look at this in a global context, has yeah. any politician ever enjoyed this kind of popularity? Because morning consults, uh, international political tracker still shows him as the number one politician globally with about 70 percent uh, popularity ratings and this is a man who's now in his ninth year in office it's almost as if anti-incumbency so far as far as his job is concerned yeah. hasn't caught up is there any global panel that you can think of very hard to think I mean you know, like in terms of those surveys today in terms of a leader who still has such a hold over the country uh, you know like after such a long um, period of time so yeah that itself is unprecedented but I think that this What's extraordinary in India is this massive premium uh, that he enjoys over his party, which is a 10 to 15 point premium, right? That I think, I can't remember in India's electoral history when that's been the case. And even in some of the other multi-party democracies, very hard to think where that's been the state. But here the only, as I said, that India has its own rules. Like one of the rules which I've learned over time also, you know, like you spoke of Karnataka too, is that we traveled in Karnataka. I think that Karnataka enjoyed an incredible amount of economic development. You, it was very visible to us when we traveled Karnataka. Now you can argue whether it was five years or ten years, but the economic development was very visible. And yet, even then, I came back and wrote that despite Karnataka being an economic miracle, it was likely that the, party, the, uh, the ruling party was likely to lose out there. So I think what that tells you about India is this, that in India the connection between economics and politics is very limited. So I did a study of this like a while back and what we found was that there have been about 30 instances when a state's economy in India has grown at a rate of 8% on average over a five-year time horizon. In more than half those cases, that government lost the election. Mm -hmm. That has not happened in anywhere in the world I know. Uh, because, uh, you know, these pocketbook issues really matter. But in India's case, for more than f half the governments to have, uh, at a state level, to have delivered a growth rate of more than 8% over a five-year time horizon and still lose an election just tells you the complexity of Indian politics and rather than, I think... Politics I, matters more than economics. Yeah, I mean, in terms of that, or the connection between politics and economics in India is very weak. So I think the historical evidence is, you know, that rising prices and high inflation 
can definitely help you lose an election. But what makes you win an election is still a very complicated answer, which is that it's, you know, it's like five or six factors or something. So I think that we have to all be careful about how we analyze Indian democracy. But uh, this data will always stay with me, that you can deliver 8% economic growth and yet lose an election, which never happens anywhere else in the world. You know, for two and a half decades, uh, you were at Morgan Stanley as a global investor. Now you're doing your own gig. How does uh, being out in your own with Rockefeller and Breakout Capital compare with the work that you were doing? Are you enjoying your entrepreneurial journey? Well, I think that it's an evolution. As someone said that being at these firms is like, you know, being in university. Sometimes, uh, beyond a point, you have to graduate. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, uh, for whatever it's worth, if you look at all the leading investors in the world uh, who I sort of look up to, they all do the same thing, which is they all have their own firms. So I think investing is very much... Uh, uh, like about a person uh, setting out on their own after a point in time. You look at all the investors in the world, they all have their own firm. So I think that it's, a, it's a, I see it as a very natural progression. I had a, a great learning uh, there at Morgan Stanley and now I feel like that for the next uh, uh, hopefully 25 years, uh, this is the way to go. This has been a fascinating conversation. We've been talking about walking around Central Park doing a conversation for a long time. Uh, wish you all the best for what you're doing and look forward to seeing you back on the election trail in India. Yeah, absolutely. That's something which I've done, as you know, for the last 25 years. And we just did our 30th trip in Karnataka and obviously 31st next year. Look forward to seeing you. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Thank you.